This is one of two training partners that I've ever had in my entire life. He's the good boy, isn't he? Yes, he is. And now he's out of camera, of course, because he moves around a lot. So, I'd like to introduce you if I could. Oh, he's a good boy. He's a good boy. I'd like to introduce you, if I could, to Lord Retaxus von Weitedheim Wade. Yes. He's like, that's a lot. I'm not crazy about it. Tax for short. So what we have is a one and a half year old Dobie, and he's a good boy. Mm -hmm. He's a good boy. Now my previous Doberman had actually passed away at about the age of seven, which has, you know, still bothers me to this day. And I feel as if a good portion of what wasn't right <laughs> was some of his diet. So when we start talking about meal prep, and we start talking about, you're not even in camera. We start talking about, you know, making sure that our friends are getting the right nutrition, biologically appropriate nutrition. Now, right away, one thing that I wanted to note on him is at one and a half years old, I want you to take a look at his teeth. Those, exceptional, it's pretty white. You don't see a whole lot of plaque. And that was actually one of the first things. Look at the ears, he's tired too because it's sleepy. But basically, he's a good boy. But basically, the vets had warned me quite a bit about diseases that can get in and issues that can get into the dog system through their mouth. You know, dogs do a lot when it comes to their mouths. It's how they communicate. It's how they interact with the world. So it's a kind of an important part to pay attention to. And one of the things that the vets constantly kept bringing up when I would take him in for checkup was make sure you're brushing his teeth, make sure you're brushing his teeth. And I was fine with that. I had no problem doing it. But I kind of started wondering about what actually was going on with, you know, wolves and dogs in the wild. Nobody's brushing their teeth, so how exactly are they getting by? Or do they just end up with tooth decay and all kinds of diseases? Um, started doing a little bit of research, and this feeding method known as BARF kind of popped up on my radar. And BARF actually stands for bones and raw food. Now, I don't necessarily tell people that I, you know, subscribe to the barf diet, but the raw food idea really kind of resonated and hit home. It made sense, especially considering, you know, 99 point whatever percentage of their DNA actually comes from wolves. So let's take a look at what meal prep for this guy is actually all about. Okay, item number one. This is a homemade bone broth, which we'll do a video on that one day. But basically, we need to make sure that they're actually getting the mineral load, the vitamin load that they would get from, you know, whatever they would pull down in the wild. And obviously, I'm not sending him outside and going after, you know, wild rabbits and so on and so forth. But you need to try to get as close to those same nutrients as possible. So what we have here is... A bone broth that we throw together and I cook this bone, the bone broth for approximately three days um, on low in my crock pot. Now as far as the bones go I have found a couple of different butcher shops um, and I mean real butcher shops I'm not talking about just the butcher shop that might be in the grocery store your local grocery store I mean we're talking this is a grass-fed, all-organic location that does its own processing. Um, you may have heard me mention them before, Dumas. But the reason I like them is you can get a lot of bones from them for next to nothing. And we're talking giant, large cow femurs and even, you know, the center shaft of the bone, which of course is full of marrow, which you want to get into this broth. So we let that cook with about maybe third of a cup of apple cider vinegar to eight quarts of water and about a handful of fresh garlic cloves because of course garlic is a nice antioxidant helps boost the immune system 
It is nasty out right now. The weather's kind of bad and puppies can get flus. So I try to make sure that all of that is in here. Now, right away as far as storage is concerned, and I'm going to talk about storage just a little bit with all of this because it matters whenever you decide to go raw diet with any of your pets. Um, you want to be worried or you want to be concerned about foodborne illnesses and you know possible bacteria buildup. So right away, Ziploc uh, twist lid container for easy pour and then of course put it right back on and then put it in the fridge. Uh, I usually make about you know six to seven of these at a time, freeze most of them and keep one in the fridge until it's gone. Um, this was a brand new container that I just pulled out yesterday. He's only eaten once, so that gives you an idea about how much I actually pour into his pail when it's time to eat, okay? The next component that I want to get into is the actual raw meat. Now, right away, I, I know what a good percentage of people out there are saying. You can't just have raw meat sitting around, so on and so forth, and you don't want to make people sick. Okay. Real quick, when it comes to raw foodborne illnesses, the concern as far as whether or not this is a safe feeding method, believe it or not, has nothing to do with your pets. It has everything to do with you. Their system can actually handle. You gotta remember, wolves will not only pull down, you know, elk, deer, whatever, but it's not like they're finishing it all right then and there. They'll actually come back a little bit. And, you know, if they find some carrion or something sitting in, you know, under a bush that something else may be killed, they, they will take that down. They've got the digestive tract to deal with those kinds of illnesses. Now, that doesn't mean we're supposed to be throwing rotten meat at them and that kind of stuff, you know, for consistent feeding habits. That's not a good idea. But if kept properly, which we're going to go over, and handled with care, so to speak. You don't have to worry about any of those things. So let's take a look real quick what we've got here. First off, we'd have to let's take a look at, this is just some beef that I picked up from my local grocery store. And I got it because it was on sale. Um, I, I make the, I guess, and this is probably not a good idea, but I make the trade off of, this is a four and five dollar packet of beef. I'm only doing it maybe once, twice you know throughout the week kind of thing and that's on a monthly basis this is the variable protein now i'll show you the stable protein that he gets every single day but ultimately this is the kind of protein that i ch that i like to change out so for this particular feeding he's going to get a couple of pieces of this loaded in with there's an egg sitting here and that whole egg goes in there not the shell and I know that's not going to make sense to a lot of people because sitting right behind that is the chicken leg quarters that he gets as well. And he will take down that entire leg quarter, bone and all. And that's the point of the BARF diet is they're getting the necessary minerals and calcium load and whatnot from the bones that they're actually ingesting. Now, when I first decided to hop into this particular feeding style for him, again, I was coming off of did I play a role in the premature death of my, pre, you know, my previous Doberman by being so locked into the idea of feeding him kibble? Now, I'm not picking a fight with the kibble industry, but unfortunately, there's a lot of research out there right now that's starting to come out and a lot of background checks on what's actually going in these foods, and it's, it's not pretty. Um, if you so desire, there is a documentary on Netflix called Pet Fooled. They did a little play on the ro you know, word there where they added a couple small L's right before the D. And uh, basically you're trying to, there's two vets trying to point out the horrors of the pet industry, especially when it comes to, you know, the kibble that's produced. So that again was a primary reason for wanting to hop into this raw diet type. But back to the beef. The reason that we do, and of course that's tax running down the stairs chasing after the cat because they have to play in the morning as well. And then he comes back upstairs, right? So the beef is, like I said, the variable protein. Um, I will sometimes, 
especially if I'm out at Dumas or, you know, any other. There's another one coming into town, Bruntes, which has been around for a long time, but they're actually opening up their own butcher market. Um, they have, Dumas has a wide array of <laughs> available protein options. So sometimes he gets beef, sometimes he gets pheasant, sometimes he gets uh, rabbit, sometimes I'll go for organ meats. Now, the organ meat part is kind of important because there's a lot of phosphorus, obviously, in the heart tissue, the you know liver tissue and whatnot. And these are things that you want to make sure filter their way into you know your pet's diet. But it's not something that you need to be feeding every single day. And a point of fact, and from experience, when I first started this diet with tax, I was giving him chicken hearts along with the chicken leg quarters on a daily basis. And he had the runs a little bit. I, I wasn't pleased with the consistency of what was coming out of the back end. Backed off of the hearts, maintained the chicken, maintained the egg. Everything started to kind of stabilize out and he was fine. Um, that taught me a huge lesson on, you know, find something to switch up. Don't just give him organ meats all the time. So that's why the beef is there. The plastic container that you see right here in the middle. Now, I like these. This is kind of one of my old kickarounds. But these are the containers that I like to use more so than any when it comes to storing and keeping raw. I know he smells it. There's the nose right there. Um, it's, it's a good idea to make sure that you're using a container that ultimately isn't going to let stuff like this. You see all that liquid in there? That's not good. That kind of stuff you don't want spilling. You know, that stuff you want to make sure it stays in the container. And these Loctite lids have a rubber lip that ultimately locks down on top of the container. basically becomes completely waterproof, liquid proof. So even if one of my children walk over to the fridge, grab this and, you know, drop it down on the floor, that's something that, you know, I don't want to have to worry about them getting their hands into raw meat juice. So these are the preferred storage containers because they're knockaround proof. They're not going to have a whole lot of issues with leakage. And that's what we're trying to to avoid okay so get that back over there and then lastly of course the chicken leg quarters now the leg quarters let's go ahead and take a look at these actually what I do with these every morning when we get started I take one of the leg quarters and I put it in this pail and I actually fill it up with hot water now this came from another previous video that I had watched and basically it was, this could seem a little bit sinister, but ultimately warming the meat gives it that, at least what we think this is true, uh, it gives them that fresh kill feel, like it's warm, like they actually pulled it down. And I don't necessarily like handing the young man a piece of cold flesh. So that's what happens with the chicken quarter right off the bat. And of course we dump all of that out, you know, after it's warmed up a little bit. All right, and finally, let's go ahead and get into assembly. So we've drained the water. There's our leg quarter right there. Uh, what we're gonna do is go ahead and take our egg. Oh, can you do it? We don't always get the one-handed crack right, but every now and then I do. Yay! Okay, so that whole egg goes in on top of the leg quarter and then we actually open up the beef as well and I will literally take just like that a little more because I love him right and then we'll deal with that in a second so there's gunk on my hand so what we don't want to do is grab things with that hand that's how you spread that food bone illness so we're not going to use this hand anymore all better clean uh went over to the sink to wash the hand so all that gunk is off there and i did use soap and that's something that you have to kind of pay attention to you need to be a little meticulous when you're actually preparing this you want to be 
aware of splash and you know overflow that kind of thing um it's not a good idea to have this stuff just sitting out on the counter and then of course kids or whoever else comes by and they put their hands on that spot and now you're making them you know opening them up to the very foodborne illnesses that the you know a lot of vets and a lot of people will basically use as a reason why this is not a good idea so be meticulous clean things up so let's go ahead and add the broth so that's here and again we just kind of that's all that's happening. Pour that in right on top of it. That's what we've got going on so far. Now, right away, I know some people are saying, geez, that's a lot of liquid. Um, if you, it, it looks like a lot of liquid, it does. Now, one thing that you'll notice with your pets once they're on this diet, or if you decide to start doing this, they won't drink a lot of water. They pull their hydration from this nutrient, from this this meal and he'll get two of these a day I got a little concerned because I would fill up his water bowl and then it would sit and it would sit and it would sit and he never quite you know seemed to drink it and I didn't understand why and then I did a little bit more research and it turns out he's getting all the liquid he really needs right there in the form of bone broth egg white and the you know the hydration he's actually pulling from the raw flesh okay Last thing we want to get into is fiber. And real quick, oh, those are pumpkin chips. Now, it is the kind of beginning of November, so we just came off of Halloween, and there's about four or five pumpkins just sitting around. So rather than doing the traditional let them rot and then throw them away and then, you know, cuss up a storm because you're picking up rotten pumpkin, I actually decided to cut them up quite a bit and put them in my food dehydrator. And they make a lovely add in to breakfast. Okay. Now, the nice thing about these are is pumpkins are actually something that wild dogs would eat. You know, they have a tendency to, especially when hungry, go after food items that are on the ground and easy. So, you know, if they can dig up a potato or, you know, like a piece of an apple or something falls off of a tree, you know, they'll take it down, especially in, you know, in between hunting times. So I like to get that little bit of fiber in there. Sometimes, well, right now it's pumpkin, sometimes it's carrots, um, and sometimes it's sweet potato chunks that I actually just cut up into cubes. But for right now, we've got pumpkins about, so we will use the pumpkins. Okay. Here's the fun part, eating. Well, as you can see, he's a little excited because he actually knows um, carpet shampooer. If you don't have one and you have pets, get one. It, it makes a big deal. But the idea is, Superhero, superhero, superhero. You can just see exactly what it's like when he takes this down. Now, I'm in my bathroom right now because that's where I like to feed him. Because you need to be able to... He drinks a lot of that broth first. But the idea is you need to be able to wipe down. And this area is very easy for me to... Use a disinfectant spray, right, you know, wipe everything down, make sure it's cleaned off. It kind of keeps it contained. Now, real quick, you'll hear a couple of chews, and then that's what we're looking for. Did you hear that bone crunch? Earlier, when I was showing you his teeth, and, you know, kind of like amazed at how white they were, that's kind of why. That's why the bone is a good idea. It actually brushes the teeth for him. His teeth are razor sharp and super strong and bright white, and it's because he cuts through bone like that. So once he finishes with that leg quarter, and believe me, he's already taken down the beef, he'll finish out the rest of the broth and the rest of the egg. And that meal goes down twice a day. He's a good boy. And here comes the fun part where he starts pushing the bucket all around the bathroom. And that's actually my cue to leave because he has a tendency to <laughs> just go all over the place with that thing. So we just kind of leave him be to his breakfast. On a final note, one thing we'll try to make sure and do is always give him a pat. Oh, little good boy. Why he's eating. You know, that's something I actually picked up from one of my trainers. You know, where I actually got him from is... It's a food sensitivity thing, and that's actually a test that they do in 
you know, humane societies and, you know, pet adoption society areas, that kind of thing. Um, food sensitivity is a big deal. You know, you want to make sure that if kids walk up and, you know, touch him on his butt or something like that or start petting him while he's eating, he's not going to go defensive and turn around and want to bite. So ideally, every time he eats and his head's in that bucket, they get a good boy and do some scratching and keep him happy. Okay, guys. That about wraps up food prep for your four-legged friends, especially if you're trying to do a raw diet. Now, I'm not saying this is the only way to feed your pets, and if you're not feeding your pets this way, you're killing them. I'm not going to go on some rant about how my way is the best way, and if you're not doing it that way, you're a horrible person. I've had two Dobermans in my life. He's number two. The first one died too early. I, for some reason, linked it to diet right away. And that was the decision and the driving force behind researching this particular eating style. It feels right. It seems like it's, like I said, a more biologically appropriate eating way or eating pattern. And, you know, at the end of the day, all that really matters is his ability to be a healthy, happy dog and at the same time, an effective training partner. So thanks for watching. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to throw them in the comment box. Uh, make sure to hit the subscribe button because there's going to be a lot more videos coming just like this. Thanks again.